Fleischman. I'm an evolutionary psychologist out of the same lab that William comes out of. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me. I also want to praise their wisdom in putting the editor of uh, Nature Human Behavior on as the first speaker today. You barely need a cup of coffee after a talk like that. It's so invigorating. <laughs> so evolutionary psychology is very commonly targeted and has been very commonly targeted before even evolutionary psychology was called a field. So if you look at uh, E.O. Wilson's book, Sociobiology, that came out in 1975, all this stuff about ants and elephants and everything was fine, but his chapter on humans was considered extremely problematic. And uh, in that book, he says something to the effect that eventually we're going to be able to harness our own genetics in the future. And this was considered a smack of eugenics, and of course it does smack of eugenics, but it was also very prescient in that now we are considering altering our genomes and doing embryo selection. So E.O. Wilson was way ahead of the curve on that. So evolutionary psychology is controversial for many reasons. Um, it challenges, do not have this up. <laughs> Turn it off, please. Um, it challenges, uh, the core assumptions that humans are, ev the idea is that humans evolved in our animals, right? Um, the idea that anything, love, cooperation, altruism can be boiled down to a selfish gene perspective. So it really offends people on many different aspects of their ideas. And these ideas provoke discomfort, especially like biological determinism and evolved sex differences. Um, so Stephen Jay Gould and Lewontin and people like that really were angry with, uh, with E.O. Wilson's book because they said it upheld the status quo, they said it could uphold sexism, and you know, Steven Pinker in his book The Blank Slate talks about this at length, that we like the idea of the blank slate, many of us do, because progressive ideologies say that human nature can be fundamentally altered, whereas evolutionary perspectives have the somewhat opposite view, that uh, aggression, selfishness, tribalism are all sort of baked in, and we have to learn how to work with those in order to have a society uh, that can, can function. Another thing that's con controversial about evolutionary psychology and, and other similar views is that the idea that if you win out in competition, like if you win out in capitalist competition, or if you win out in a clash of cultures, then in some way that makes your culture or whatever uh, mores and norms and morals that you are endorsing uh, at least better in the competition and better in a specific way. Uh, so evolutionary psychology has had a lot of controversial research topics. Uh, Randy Thornhill, who's my, my neighbor in New Mexico, uh, he, he's written a book on rape that basically said rape uh, has an evolutionary reason behind it. Uh, men don't commit rape because they're trying to uh, enact their misogyny on women. They commit rape because sometimes they would get women pregnant that way. And also, uh, David Buss, my former advisor, said that things like murder and stalking have evolutionary reasons behind them. Uh, there's a, a famous book from Daly and Wilson called Homicide, which has at length explanations for why infanticide has over human evolutionary history been the most common form of homicide. So you have things like stalking, rape, and baby killing, very popular topics in evolutionary psychology. And so these have been uh, considered you know, very, very controversial. Um, John Tooby, before he died recently, he's one of the founders of evolutionary psychology, he said that modern medicine makes it such that people can uh, reproduce who previously would not have survived, and he said that this could lead in the long term to a genetic meltdown. He basically espoused the idea of dysgenics, which has been an idea that has been called to be censored by scientists like Rebecca Sear and others who say that if you endorse dysgenics, you're saying that some genotypes are better than others, which is basically endorsing eugenics. So uh, a lot of evolutionary scientists want disclaimers about the use of these ideas. They want to say, okay, we're going to teach evolution, but we want to teach people also that there's these social Darwinism misuses of these ideas. I've seen recently somebody calling to say that if we teach high schoolers or university students Mendelian genetics, we have to combat the idea that these genetic traits are hardwired, or otherwise they might inadvertently become eugenicists. So professors are having a hard enough time teaching Mendelian genetics to high school students, but now they also have to teach them how not to be eugenicists. Um, as William was talking about before, there's this article in the Boston Globe by Daniel Conroy Beam, our colleague, and he said that evolutionary psychology has a, a body count, and he said uh, it's, evolutionary psychology is a safe space for provocateurs. And he said that like it was a bad thing. <laughs> so 
um, I wrote a, a response that you can look up. It says, does evolutionary psychology really cause mass shootings? And I refuted a couple of his claims. For example, he cites Elliot Rogers and this Sydney stabber who stabbed a bunch of people in a mall in, in Sydney, Australia, as examples of evolutionary psychology causing murder. Uh, neither one of these guys talked about evolutionary uh, psychology at all. Elliot Rogers wrote a manifesto. I looked up the word evolution in it, and I found he was talking about the revolutionary World of Warcraft game. <laughs> There's also a, a big problem with censoring ideas on the basis of perceived harms, right? So right-coded ideas are going to face harsher uh, criticism than uh, and backlash. So one thing that you, if you read population genetics articles or sort of uh, calls for censorship in population genetics, you will see this buffalo shooter from 2022 mentioned over and over again. So this guy, he goes into a uh, supermarket and I think he kills 10 or injures 10 uh, black supermarket shoppers. Um, and he misused population genetics, they say, to justify racist and anti-Semitic views. And this has sparked calls for geneticists to censor uh, research or to prevent graphs and charts in a different way. So he's got these two population genetics charts in his manifesto. And the idea here is that if he hadn't found these population genetics charts, he would have stayed home and read White Fragility instead of going out and murdering people. <laughs> There's no evidence at all that this guy, that these population genetics charts had this view. And somewhat close in time to when these calls for censorship were being made, there was a chart that showed uh, discrete racial groupings that was in a journal and there was a call for this chart to be changed because it made racial groupings look, look different. Uh, so you know, we have no idea if censorship would actually really prevent violence. And I don't know if you guys know this, the vast majority of murders are committed without a manifesto <laughs> against people who are close to us. Uh, so left idea, I, left coded ideas are really questioned. There was this Nashville shooter a few years ago, uh, a potentially a, a trans man, it's unclear exactly. And uh, this uh, person wrote, in their journal, it was called a manifesto in some places, it was called a journal in others, that essentially uh, white, white privilege was a, a major problem in our society. And this did not, as far as I ever saw, call for censorship calls for ideas about white privilege. Nobody said we should censor ideas about white privilege, and certainly nobody said that non-binary people, that the, being non-binary, as this person may have been, uh, is going to be a problem for, uh, for um, violence. So there's also a harm of alternative explanations. Think about hereditarianism. Hereditarianism is the idea that some ethnic differences in success or IQ or different kinds of metrics are caused by genetics rather than by culture or rather than by uh, discrimination. If you look at uh, hereditarianism, it's maligned uh, like as much as gain of function research in terms of the harm it could potentially cause. But rarely do people grapple with what are the alternative explanations. So if you completely say that there's no biological basis for ethnic differences in outcomes, what you must, by implication, endorse is that things like microaggressions, discrimination, are causing these disparities. And you could see, if you were aiming to, all kinds of places in society where the idea that discrimination is widespread, that discrimination is causing some people to be oppressed to such an extent that they can't get ahead no matter how much DEI is imposed, is an idea that could cause aggression and violence. And if you look at you know, revolutions throughout history, the idea that there's an oppressive class has been pretty popular as a uh, rationale for violence. So there's a, there's a bigger picture here. You know, evolutionary psychology is basically about how in the competition for survival, certain psychological adaptations won out over others, that human psychology has been shaped by iterated competition over time. And I also see that in the university system. So we've been talking a lot about how universities can get better, how about universities can stop doing as much uh, censorship, and how we should not compel speech, for example. But I see that there's gonna be a competition that's either gonna fundamentally change universities or that's going to uh, make them die, <laughs> basically. So uh, yeah, I've seen recently private donors offering people money to do uh, individual research with a three or four page application. I've seen private donors giving people money. My friend Ayla, who's a, a pornographic actress and sex researcher, 
um, has done research for the last year on the basis of a private donor, and she can't get published in mainstream journals because she has no IRB approval. She has, in some instances, 400,000 data points, kinds of data that, uh, that an academic would, would kill for. And so she doesn't get published in journals like Nature Human Behavior, where perhaps dozens of people will read her article. Instead, she publishes on blogs where millions of people read her research. So over time, I think that the university system uh, is, is really going to not thrive in this kind of competition. And I, I hope that there are some universities, like University of Austin and others, that really take up the challenge and say, OK, if we want to com compete with the private marketplace of ideas, if we want to compete with independent researchers who are not beholden to ideas about harm, we're really going to have to streamline the research process. We're really going to have to not eat up researchers' time and grant money. Uh, in, in applying for grant money and talking about how they're going to remedy social ills. We're going to really have to try and appeal to the independent discovery spirit that we see in intellectuals throughout history, rather than at the you know, perhaps craven, I shouldn't use that word, craven desire to solve the kinds of problems that are considered most important and most likely to give researchers money. Um, universities and degrees are going to lose value. They're going to lose merit over time. Uh, in this competition. And so while we're here talking about how these ideas can be solved from within the system, I think that it, the universities will either figure out how to solve these ideas or perish against the private marketplace of ideas. Thank you.